Inflation, unemployment, retail sales, and housing starts, they're all trending down. And they all point to the high likelihood of a rate cut happening next week. But the question you have to ask yourself is, will another rate cut even move the housing market at all? Or will it just bring more sellers into the marketplace like the last rate cut did? That's what we're going to be discussing on this week's episode. And in addition to this, we attended an event with the mayor of Burnaby just yesterday, and he discussed the multiplex plan and how his city is adopting that provincial legislation. And they're basically on the forefront of it. This is a topic that many people are interested in is the event held about 400 people was totally sold out and had about 100 people on the wait list. Multiplex and the interest therein is also noted in the videos on our channel as the two episodes that we've done regarding the multiplex plan are the two most watched videos we have ever created in the last four years. And so the point of me saying all this is if you happen to be a homeowner in the city of Vancouver or in the city of Burnaby, and you'd like to consider or explore the option of a joint venture deal with a developer where we would buy your land and you would reinvest some of that capital into the building of four to six units on your lot and then share in the profit of the sale of those lots. This is a method to essentially capitalize on your property, realizing a much higher potential return than if you were to just sell it on the open market. If you are curious about this uh, or you'd like to learn more, please reach out to us, book a consultation using the Calendly link below, and we can kind of discuss what the purchase and sale of developing your lot might look like. Okay, let's get right into today's episode. Off the top, let's talk about inflation because we saw an inflation print last week and well, it beat expectations. Inflation dropped to 2.7%, coming down from 2.9% the month before. And no shock here, no surprise, but it is of course the shelter cost index that remains the biggest driver of inflation with uh, the rate of increase at 6.2% compared to where it was last year at like 4.8%. When we dissect that shelter cost index, the mortgage interest cost component of that was up like 22% year over year uh, and rent was up 8.8%. Okay, that's actually the highest it's been since 1983. So this is obviously a huge number. And if you're out there and you've maybe been looking for a rental property lately, uh, you'll understand how expensive rents are. But I'd also like to say like this definitely looks to be a lagging indicator. I mean, if you watch what's happening with rental rates in Vancouver or in Toronto, I mean, rental rates peaked, uh, all, I don't know, about a year ago here. So rental rates are definitely coming down in, in Canada's major cities. So that index certainly seems to be lagging. But either way, it's still quite high and fascinating to see it the highest in basically 40 years. When we look at inflation and exclude the shelter component, CPI was just 1.3%. Keeping in mind, of course, that the shelter index is largely controllable by how much the overnight interest rate is. Interest rate comes down, that component of CPI comes down with it. The expectations for that CPI print was 2.8, right? We got 2.7, so it was better than expected. And that saw the markets basically react real quick and price in a 90% chance of a rate cut at next Wednesday's Bank of Canada meeting. We still have employment running at like a 22 year low. Business insolvencies are still ripping higher. And that 90% chance will likely be correct. Um, we'll see. But if it does happen, it'll probably only be a quarter point cut like it was last time, which would bring it down to 4.5% overnight rate. That, I would think, is still more than enough to continue downward pressure on inflation. But will it do anything to housing? You know, maybe another cut, again, just brings more sellers back to the market like we saw with the previous rate cut. Because buyers still appear to be sidelined as 4.5% still means your mortgage rate is 55 6% 6 still, which makes housing quite unaffordable. So we will see how much that moves the index then. Might take till September to see any real noticeable shift in Canada's housing market. Yeah, and I mean, when we look at the unemployment rate at 6.4% and it's rising both here and in the States, I suspect we're going to start to see uh, a rate a rate cut. I, I think we're going to see them for the balance of the year. 
I'm a bit more bullish on that just because I think things are probably a little bit worse than they appear to be. Uh, and the cracks that we're seeing under our current economy could grow. So we need to bring down the restrictive level of borrowing uh, to try and get things like our GDP and, and try and get our economy running a little bit better again. Uh, let's have a look at retail sales because this is a very good indicator of what the consumer's feeling, what the consumer is spending on, and whether they're spending. Uh, all of it indicative to uh, bigger purchases like homes. So, with that said, uh, the metric fell 0.8% month over month. This obviously excludes volatile items. Uh, sales were when you sorry when you exclude volatile sales. Uh, they were down 1.4% month over month. In fact, retail sales have only increased in one of the months in all of 2024. And what's more is retail sales have been flat since 2022. So during this time, you know, we've added 6% more to the population base, but with no additional spending. So it's really starting to show that the Canadian consumer is tapped out, not spending their money on things, likely because there's so much more money going to things like interest costs, like Dan mentioned on their mortgage, or the high rents that they're spending. Either way, they're not consuming materials like they were before, and that's slowing the overall economy as well. And something else that's very slow right now is housing starts. Do you remember back in April when uh, Trudeau promised that uh, there'd be an extra 3.87 million homes in Canada by 2031? Well, let's just check in and see how that promise is coming <laughs> along. Canadian Sorry. housing starts fell 9% just month over month. Um, but what's worse is housing starts are down 14% nationally year over year. To hit Trudeau's numbers, we would need to see housing starts up 100% year over year. So we're currently sitting about 114% off that mark, and that's a pretty rough start. And it gets a bit worse when we look locally here in the province of British Columbia, where housing starts are down 12% year over year. Sorry, that's month over month. It gets worse when you look year over year. The province is down 38% year over year in housing starts, a tremendous drop. And let's go look over at Toronto because they sort of emulate what we do here. And well, new condo sales in Toronto, new condo sales lead housing starts, right? They pre-sale and then they build. New condo sales are running at the lowest level dating back to 1997. That's a 27-year low in pre-sale sales. So when this initiative from Trudeau was originally presented, I mean, we, we discussed that it was impossible. and you know, we're only three months in and, and I get it, right? The housing market doesn't move on a dime here and three months isn't maybe that fair to be judging it. But ultimately, to have things trending this far down this quickly, it really goes to show how empty that promise really was, okay? There's nothing in the marketplace right now that's pointing to the ability to incentivize, incentivize builders to bring homes to this market. Taxes have only increased, city fees have only increased, access to cheap credit is still non-existent. The current landscape is just not hospitable to builders and building. And so they're not. I mean, <laughs> it seems like the only thing that Trudeau has been able to successfully grow during his tenure is the actual size of the government. It's up 42%. There's 42% more people working in the government than there were in 2015. It's just ballooned. Imagine, just imagine the amount of money spent on that many more people in the government. And uh, I don't know about you, but when's the last time you went to a government institution and felt like they were operating a lot faster than they were just nine years ago with almost 50% more people behind the desk? I don't see it. You know, and, and Dan, you, you, you mentioned how giving him three months after the announcement uh, might not be fair. But when you consider the fact that he's ballooned, or not ballooned, when you consider the fact he's grown his government by 42%, they should theoretically be 42% faster and more capable. And when you actually consider that he made these announcements, similar announcements back in 2016, with the Housing Accelerator Fund, and still not one home has been built, I think the three months is too long, in my opinion. I think he should be 
all over this. Uh, but instead, we end up hearing articles that come out of the Financial Post that are starting to talk about the government taxing your primary residence, the equity on your primary residence. Now, this is an article out of the Financial Post, and it came out this week, and I want to go over it because I think it's absolutely incredible that we find ourselves having to discuss something like this. So get this. A new article from the Financial Post this week stated that the Prime Minister and parts of his cabinet met with a government-funded think tank called Generation Squeeze to discuss the idea of a primary home equity tax. Now, before we go any further, can we just stop for a second and consider what kinds of bias a government-funded think tank might have towards the current government in power? Probably quite a big one. And generational fairness? Well, this sounds like a new political buzzword, potentially some political messaging for an upcoming election. And you've got to be very careful with messaging because it turns into a narrative. And that, quite frankly, has me feeling like I'm being a little misled from the start about what this is actually about. As we dig through the article, it feels like the government is banking on young voters by looking at how to create generational taxation as opposed to generational fairness, on hardworking Canadians who have spent their entire life saving money, financing their mortgage, paying it off, and paying it down. After all, such older people's homes have often benefited from decades of capital appreciation, something that young people, and, and in many ways, myself included, contributed nothing to their value. And quite frankly, we weren't even born when some of those houses were built. But somehow we feel entitled that we, we should have a piece of this or that our government should tax that? When I take a quote right from uh, the website of Generation Squeeze, it reads, and I quote, the first step is putting a price on housing inequity by adding a modest surtax on, home valued, uh, on homes valued at more than $1 million. This surtax will apply only to the top 12% of high value homes. The vast majority of Canadians won't pay a penny more. I feel like we've heard this before. But it will help slow down prices so earnings have a chance to catch up. Well, housing appreciation in Canada over the last 40 years is up 600% and wages are up 35%. I'm not quite sure how one more tax is going to allow wages to catch up. Anyhow, this demonstrates an allegiance to the Canadian dream that good homes should be in reach for what hard work or for what hard work can earn. Okay, thanks, think tank. But let's look at Vancouver as an example here. And how many homes in Vancouver are worth a million dollars or more? Somehow, I think more than twelve percent. So right off the get go, this is totally misleading. But let's carry on. In fact, let's look at the boogeyman. So first of all, it was those nasty foreign buyers, right? They bought up nearly 1% of MLS sales. Holy cow. Two, it was those darn house flippers who made a profit after making a run-down, crappy old house livable and adding it to the housing stock for both renters and buyers. Then third, it was those nasty investors. They funded the construction for future dwellings for renters. And yes, should they be entitled to a profit, they put their money at risk. I believe that there should be a reward for the level of risk that you take. Fourth and finally, it's now those damn old people who hit, you know, who've been in their homes for 30 to 40 years and have worked to pay down and pay off that hard-earned home and also had the good fortune of capital appreciation. That wasn't their fault. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where the thinking comes in in this think tank, because they clearly haven't done any thinking. This is a political bias, and they want something for nothing, because they feel like they're entitled to it. I don't know about you, Dan, but when I first got into wanting to buy a house, I spent a decade working in a ditch in Alberta, putting in sewer pipes, working my way up through a company, having to make unruly sacrifices. So it was called hard work. And it wasn't until I came here and then had to buy a tiny little shoebox and start flipping my way up through the housing ladder. That's how I got started. 
And that's how most Canadians need to. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's clearly very little understanding in this because nothing that they've proposed has anything to do with fixing the symptoms of our housing market. Like maybe we need to look at immigration first and maybe understand the consequences of bringing in the amount of people we did at the pace we did and what it would do to infrastructure. And I don't just mean infrastructure in terms of the kinds of roads we have. I mean infrastructure to our schools, infrastructures to our medical system, to every other service industry that exists in Canada. Maybe we should look at the cost of development, the cost of materials, the cost of land, available trades, quality of professionals. And then let's say all of that adds up to the fact that we do need to tax primary residents. What do we do with the funds that we tax then? What's the plan? How do we bring down the price? Because price is a function of supply and demand. Anyhow, in my opinion, the consequences from something like this send, would send the Canadian economy in the entire economy into a tailspin, and it would cause so much more pain than it would any kind of benefit, and I'm just not sure that's been thought through carefully. The article quotes Sir Winston, uh, Sir Winston Churchill because he is famously quoted as saying, I contend that for a nation to try to tax itself into prosperity is like a man standing in a bucket and trying to lift himself up by the handle. But I would also venture to say that if you are in a think tank or you're on this position, you might want to think about what Mark Twain has said. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. It's Canadian housing is kind of right now the last tax haven that exists. And, and sure, of course, you know, the government looks to what is sort of the lowest hanging fruit, I think. And so they're looking to that saying, look, there's so much money there. It's the easiest swipe of the pen to get a few more billion dollars in the coffers so they can maybe build their government to 82 percent bigger this year, whatever it is. Obviously, the miss the misspending of, 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 you know, tax revenue seems to be exorbitant here, but, you know, I don't want to get off topic either way. Um, yeah, it, it's, of course they're going to look at it. And I remember we talked about this a bit during the COVID run up, right? When we saw these house prices going up 20% year over year, we're like, well, at some point the government's going to come back and say, well, you're welcome, but you know, we, we want a piece of that back to our, for ourselves. And that's kind of, you know, maybe along the lines of where this is thinking the million dollars thing, of course, that's ridiculous. You know, the, the two, biggest provinces in the country obviously have an average price well above that so that's just ignorant but ultimately you know i think it's a death blow i think it's a political suicide if they were to do that uh in the same sense that you know we look to the lower mainland here you know there's thousands upon thousands of unauthorized or illegal suites that are tenanted and there's no major crackdown on that right no no sitting politician is going to go after people in unauthorized suites to put renters out on the street. It just wouldn't happen. They, they would never win if they were campaigning on, on such a platform. And the same here. I mean, like I said, it's literally can Canadian's last tax haven. And as Trudeau even just mentioned, right, we can't bring house prices down because people need those high house prices because that's their retirement. So to take away their retirement too, I mean, oh my goodness, it would the backlash would be immense. I, I think the pitchforks would come out and I, I just don't think it's happening. Of course, they're going to explore it because they've taxed everything else to all hell. So why not go after that as well? But uh, I think that's not going to happen. Well, also like, you know, how many taxes do we have that were implemented to try and control price and none of them have worked because you can't bring a knife to a gunfight. It's not going to work. It's just not an equivalent. So you need to look at other policy measures like building the 4 million homes. Why hasn't one home been built? Because it's easier to stroke a pen, I guess. <laughs> of course, yeah. Okay, well, let's wrap it up here on a, sort of a mini market update because we saw prices, HPI prices fall for the first time in 2024 in June. And people are probably curious what's going on. You know, we predicted that they would start to fall further in the upcoming months. And right now that definitely looks to be true. Because in July, so far, this is Friday, July the 19th, we're recording this. And as of today, so far this month, the average price is already down 68000 bucks, And the median is off slightly at 10000 
thousand dollars. We will, of course, see where it all washes out at the month's end. But either way, there's no doubt that both those metrics are trending down, which means they're going to pull down the HPI as well. Sales volumes pretty similar to where they were last year, but last year was slow, so things are still just grinding. And I think they're just going to grind downwards and to the right for the rest of summer. But we'll see what September brings. September might turn things around. I don't know yet. But uh, the reason I say that it might is because, well, there's another rate announcement then. And maybe there's one next week. And maybe there's one in September. You know, you combine three rate cuts on top of a bunch of inventory and kind of options. Is that enough to maybe bring buyers back to the market? Or is it just going to be continue flood of, of sellers? You know, really pushing inventory levels up until the end of, of this year. Lots of moving pieces as always. Ryan, what's your take on where things may change in our fall market? Yeah, you know, I think uh, one thing, if the Bank of Canada doesn't cut far enough, uh, then uh, I, I, I think we'll continue down the path of uh, in, in consequential uh, result and uh, the barometer won't move because it's just still not, it's still unaffordable. You know, I, the National Association of Realtors down in the States um, you know, for every one percentage point that the overnight rate changes, it unlocks or enables 5 million buyers across the country to come into the marketplace. So if we look at our prospective uh, population rates, that would, that would effectively mean about 500,000 uh, buyers in Canada would enter the market once we reach a 1% drop in interest rates. So I do think it'll have a material change. I just don't think we're there yet. And I think uh, the Bank of Canada needs to continue down this pace. Of course, they don't want the economy front running their decision. So they're going to be slow. And uh, if, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll carry on, I, I think, the, 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 at the pace they're going. There you have it. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. Many moving pieces here, and uh, we're getting into the depths of summer. Things are slow, but things still move. It's kind of like lava out there, kind of rolling <laughs> down a hill. Uh, either way, thanks again, as always, for tuning in. Have a great weekend. Bye.